Maybe, just maybe, the global pandemics provided a silver lining for one of society's most vulnerable groups, the homeless. In many countries, emergency shelters have been set up. Extra housing provided the number of people living on the streets has fallen. The question is how to keep the momentum going. This is Roundtable. Very good to have your company. I'm David Foster. In this programme, we will be talking to some of those working with the homeless who say they are encouraged by what they've seen, but they are also a little worried that rising unemployment could undo some of the good that has been done. Global coronavirus cases are now past 31.5 million. And according to one former UN expert, housing has become the frontline defense against the coronavirus. So what about the 150 million people or 2% of the world's population who live on the streets or in overcrowded shelters? How can they sanitize their hands and stay at home without a home? Many developing countries simply cannot afford to house the homeless. But as the pandemic took hold earlier this year, some nations took action. In March, the UK government launched an Everybody In scheme, where thousands of rough sleepers were taken off the streets. Barcelona City Council announced an additional 9 million euros to support homeless people during 2020. And the Trump administration says it's distributing about $3 billion in coronavirus aid to help the homeless find emergency shelter. So has coronavirus shown us ways to end homelessness, or will these prove to be only temporary solutions? It is time for us to begin the conversation at this round table. Later on in the programme, we'll be hearing from Lydia Stazen, Executive Director of the Institute of Global Homelessness, and Nan Roman, who's President and Chief Exec of the National Alliance to End Homelessness. They're both in the United States. But first, I'm pleased to say we're joined from Manchester in the UK. Amy Vahl is there. She was homeless herself as a teenager and now works as a campaigner for better housing. And we go south to Northamptonshire, also in England. David Ireland there, Chief Executive of World Habitat, an international charity working to bring the best housing to the people who need it the most. Welcome to both of you. Uh, when the pandemic first struck, there was a campaign called Bring Everyone In in England. Have they managed, Amy, to bring everybody in? <clears throat> wow. Well, when uh, the news of the pandemic broke, as you know, I mean, I woke up one morning to read the headline that I dreamed of reading for, for probably the previous 10 years, which was every rough sleeper in the UK will be housed by the weekend. And I nearly fell out of bed when I read that headline, because that, as I say, is something that I have been campaigning for for uh, a number of years now. So uh, my immediate thought went straight on to what happens after that and where do we go from here? Because I knew that there would be a huge amount of resources being put into bringing people off the streets and, and making them safe in the immediate term. But my thought was, what happens in a in a long term fashion and, and where will these people live and how will they be supported uh, further down the line? Was it successful? Did they bring everybody in, every rough sleeper off the streets? And if so, has that momentum been maintained? Certainly, from where I was sitting, it was a very, very, very difficult task to bring everybody in. And I live in a, almost a semi-rural area. And I know just in the town where I live, there were a number of rough sleepers who had almost been forgotten about and were, um, you know, stuck in this little village with no members of the public to help them. And they didn't have access to food, to washing facilities, to toilets, to anywhere to clean themselves. And they were in a really, really bad way. And I spent um, about three weeks just working almost as a member of the public, not in my professional capacity, but actually working um, at a ground level and trying to, to just to support these men as, as a member of the public. And I found that it was such an arduous and difficult process to do that. Um, and people were slipping through the nets. And one of the problems that I encountered very quickly on was 
a lot of people went into hotels and that was fantastic and they were you know for the first time ever they were receiving lots and lots of intensive kind of support and people around them and busyness of, of making solutions happen um, but quite quickly these solutions I think for a lot of people did break down because um, the, the chaotic lifestyles that, that a lot of rough sleepers unfortunately unfortunately live um, is not going to to blend well in a in a four-star hotel environment. Oh, so you're like, saying the, the the sort of new order that was forced upon them in charitable ways was not something that they could deal with? Almost certainly yes I would say so and I'm sure for that for lots of people that program's been very successful and for people who um, you know just want to be housed and they want to move quickly and maybe they've not been homeless for very long and you know they're they're just desperate to, to, to get themselves straight and get themselves a roof over their head I'm sure that that was a fantastic initiative that worked really really well and I'm sure okay so, so it was as you say a dream come true it didn't actually turn out to be perfection but perhaps it's worked to some extent and in ways that perhaps you, you never imagined. David, let me come to you. Uh, Robert Jenry, um, he's a member of Parliament, he's the UK Housing Secretary. Um, he's talking about 6,000 houses for rough sleepers um, here in the UK. And this is what he said, thousands of lives have been protected as a result of the shared commitment to protect the most vulnerable in our society throughout this national emergency. And we continue to fund this vital project. The government wants to end rough sleeping for good and we now have a real opportunity to deliver on this moral mission. Is there anywhere near being achieved? Well, I think, I mean, I agree with Amy that it was a remarkable achievement to bring everybody inside. And um, it was this country at its best. Um, and I think the ambition of what the government has said about making sure that those people don't don't go back onto the streets is really important. You know, it, it would be such a wasted opportunity um, if that were to happen, and it would be an immoral way of treating people. Um, what what I think the 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 the, the's, um, the challenge now is is how do you actually bring those people um, not just inside, but actually provide a long term um, sustainable home for them, and also how do you make sure that all the other things that are happening at the moment don't um, lead to another wave of homelessness as people lose their jobs and people get evicted um, from their homes after protections around um, rents um, and the furloughing scheme are phased out over this period? But are you saying that largely it has been successful? We're just talking about maintaining it um, in, the, in the future, but up till this point, most of the rough sleepers in England have been taken off the streets, offered whether it be a hotel, an empty office block, or whatever it happens to be, somewhere to stay, and they, they are still there. If so, that's that's pretty successful, isn't it? It is. And we, we um, support something called the European End Street Homelessness Campaign, which operates across a lot of um, countries in Europe. And not, not everybody's done the same as what's happened in the UK. Um, there are some countries in Europe where all that has happened is that... Um, um, hostels and night shelters have closed and there's actually more people have been forced onto the street. So it was a policy choice um, of what happened and it was a good one. Um, and, um, you know, I think you have to congratulate everybody who was involved um, at that time for a remarkable achievement. But it, it requires another really coordinated um, and remarkable set of, of things to be done to ensure... Well, hold on to that thought, if, if you would, for just a moment. I want to go back to Amy, because as you know, you're only here for the first half of the programme. Uh, you two, you were homeless when you were 16. I'm not going to ask how many years ago that was. You could tell us if you like. How do you think the homeless experience now compares to then? Sorry, didn't hear you. No, just there, about 20 years ago now, so it is showing my age um, there. So it, it's a while ago that I was homeless, but it's something that never leaves me because um, it was a really, really poignant experience in my life. And it's something that's led me to do everything that I've done really ever since that point. And I actually was really, really fortunate in my experience of homelessness because I never rough slept. I wasn't on the streets. I wasn't addicted to drugs. I wasn't exploited. I wasn't, um, you know, preyed on by criminal gangs. So I, you know, had a, a, a great solution which was offered to me and I, I, I really benefited from that. And that's why I'm so passionate about creating similar kinds of situations and, and solutions for people who are experiencing Amy, homelessness Amy, sorry to butt in. In the intervening 20 years, do you think much had changed for those who were homeless? Uh, and how much has changed in the last six months? 
compared to yeah. the beginning of this year? Very much so. And um, I think, I mean, I started campaigning and trying to look for solutions in homelessness um, when I was, was back in 2011. So I used to work for local authorities and it was off the back of the last recession that I felt that new solutions were going to be needed. So I've been um, it, working in almost a self-employed capacity in this sector for almost 10 years now. And I've seen things change dramatically. And one of the things I have seen change is that people are very interested in finding solutions now and when I was doing this perhaps in 2011 2012 it was just me it felt like at some times um you know it was me going you know let's give them housing let's find a way to create housing solutions and people weren't even looking at that in the UK so at this point. if and more and more people are interested today how do you keep that momentum going you first Amy and, and then you David well, certainly for me, it's about inspiring, it's about motivating, it's about innovating, uh, bringing communities together, matching, you know, talent, skill, resources, blending those together. And I can't solve homelessness by myself, but I'm sure if I teamed up with the members of your show, we could do a massive, massive effort together. And, you know, if we put our, our, our talents and resources together. So I'm leading a project now with the Winston Churchill Trust, which is um, leading a national strategy group where we're bringing the providers together who can give housing, can give support and can give the solutions that are needed. Did, um, but perhaps they're missing. So, 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 so sorry, I've got to move on to David. We don't have all of that time. So you're bringing people together, David. People are starting to listen. Um, is it an international conversation or is the UK in this regard way ahead of most other places? Well, there's lots of other places have done remarkable things and there is a, there's a lot of um, places which shown that this is a solvable problem. Um, the best known is... Because Finland, actually the UK adopted something from Finland, didn't it, called Housing First? So Housing First is... That everywhere which has really solved homelessness has done it through Housing First, and that is providing a long-term sustainable home for people, um, not just maintaining people in shelters and hostels. Um, and that approach works, um, is actually cost-effective, um, and, um, and it's sustainable. It, 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 it is, it's been proven to work in lots of other places. We're starting on that journey in the UK, but we've got a long way to go. Um, but if you look at places um, like Scandinavia, look at Finland, you look at some of the, 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 the cities in the United States, it can be done. Um, and what it can be done is everybody has to follow the same path, follow the same objectives of getting people into long-term sustainable homes. And it can be done. And yet one of your volunteers, I think, in Barcelona said that uh, we've discovered our limits. Yeah, it's a challenge, and um, for for many cities, we're you know uh, 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 the beginning of that journey and not at the end of it. Um, and um, there are there are lots of great people doing lots of fantastic things, but until there's a, a policy and a coordination, so all of those people are achieving trying to achieve the same objective and um, and and coordinating their activities is always going to be hard. It's always going to be a challenge, but it is possible. We know it's possible. Um, and, Very quick um, one, if I may. Those temporary homes, shelters, whatever they are, that have been given to so many people during the pandemic in the UK. I know you'd like them to be made permanent, will they? I don't think the hotels themselves are the long-term solution. They've done. They've so, solved a, a, a really important purpose. But what people need is a is a is a permanent home with their own front door, with their own with with their own way of, of, of ability to to lead their lives within it. Um, a hotel is not that. It's a is is a way of keeping people safe through a pandemic. And um, what we need to do is find the permanent homes that people can move out of the hotels not back onto the street, but back into a sustainable home. Mm. And indeed address each case on a personal case-by-case -case basis. Uh, I wish it had been longer with both of you. Thank you very much indeed uh, for joining us on the round table. Thank, Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. OK, time for us to continue the conversation. Join us from Chicago in the US. We have Lydia Stazen. Executive Director of the Institute of Global Homelessness. And we go to Washington, D.C. to say hello to Nan Roman, President and Chief Executive of the National Alliance to End Homelessness. In the first half of the programme, we talked largely about what the UK has done since the pandemic began. Um, 
everybody in was one of the slogans, bring everybody in. The other one was the housing first, adopting a, a Finnish model. Do you think the UK has um, got the right idea? You, you first, Lydia, do you think the UK has got it sort of sort of OK? Well, as everyone was kind of coming together during the first moments of crisis in this pandemic, we really were watching what the UK was doing and connecting those learnings to the 13 communities around the world where the Institute of Global Homelessness works. And, um, you know, we've seen different responses around the world to this. Some of our partners in Adelaide, Australia, Sydney, Australia, um, and even Montevideo in Uruguay have followed the same kind of everybody in uh, tactics that the UK really led with. Um, to bring more vulnerable people in off the street in really quick, um, quick time frames and, and upping that urgency. So certainly interesting to see that model spread around the world. Um, and and other, did it work? Yeah, it, it absolutely did. I mean, you know, people who, as, as we've touched on, people who are experiencing homelessness are really at risk to um, viruses on the street. And so moving quickly, moving people into individual accommodation is absolutely the right move in terms of protecting um, people to the, the fullest extent that we're able to. Now, what do you think the U.S. needs to do uh, with regard to this problem? Because I know you're not very uh, impressed by what's happening right now. Well, I think the U.S. Uh, has responded to the problem and moved a lot of people into private accommodation. Sort of an interesting feature, I think, of the whole situation that's not common in disasters or, or recessions is that there's a lot of vacant property. And we moved a lot of people into hotels and motels around the country, uh, which was great. People who are CDC recommended needed to be moved for quarantine and isolation and so forth. What we didn't do here so much, I think, was to address unsheltered homelessness. About 37% of people who are homeless in the U.S. don't have any shelter at all. They sleep rough, as you would say, in the U.K. Um, and those people have largely still stayed outdoors, although there have been things done to help them outdoors. We have had a fairly low, surprisingly low rate of uh, infection among people who are homeless. There have been some outbreaks in shelters, but overall we've had a reasonably low rate of COVID infection among people who are homeless. Yeah, it's quite interesting, isn't it? Because in, in the UK and, and the same in other countries as well, care homes where people um, congregate have been severely hit by COVID. There might be a fear amongst rough sleepers um, and others, but particularly rough sleepers, that going into a shelter could actually put them more at risk than remaining where they were. How, did you have to deal with that? Uh, we didn't have to deal with that so much, I think, largely because we had to deconcentrate the shelters. We had guidance uh, from the Centers for Disease Control about giving, you know, having more space between beds and not to have so many congregate activities in the shelters. And although some places stood up new shelters, more places seem to have taken down shelter beds. So we didn't have more shelter to put people into. And there's been indications, of course, that the virus doesn't spread as much outdoors. So that I think in some areas, even though uh, there was, again, guidance that we should that people should be brought in, I think there was a feeling also amongst homeless people and providers that maybe they were better off outside. I don't really think Do you that's think the case, but it, yeah, sh sorry, so I didn't mean to interrupt. Let me go to Lydia. Um, but this is for either one of you at any time. Lydia, do you think the fact that there is um, a conversation taking place here, um, in in other corners of the world, is is a sign that this pandemic, as I described it at the top of the program, um, that it could well have a silver lining uh, for one of society's most vulnerable groups, which is the homeless. I think what's been happening through this pandemic is all of the weaknesses in the social safety net and in, you know, other sort of parts of, of living in the world have really been been brought to light. Those cracks have been brought to light. And I think that there is an awareness of homelessness as a public health crisis in a way. Um, homelessness has always been a public health crisis, um, but this has really brought that to light. And so we are seeing urgency in, you know, all different sorts of actors from government to social services to even the people who are homeless, who might be more willing to um, come indoors or engage with services, um, you know, 
because they're fearful of the virus as well. So we're just seeing heightened levels of urgency and attention on this issue. So I think only positive um, things can come from that. And, and now looking at the, at the countries and communities around the world that have successfully brought people in off the street and into individual accommodation, now really the pressure yeah. is to move them to See, one, of, one of the difficult things is, uh, and, and it's, we know it's not over yet, but as life returns to normal and commercial properties that we use to, to house the rough sleepers, um, hotels, et cetera, et cetera, as they become um, occupied once again with um, the normal clientele, if you like, then what, what happens to the homeless then? Well, I think we're seeing some really good advocacy from the social services sector. So I know that the, the governments in New South Wales, Australia, have put forward significant tranche of funding um, to help move people along to permanent accommodation. Um, here in Chicago, actually, the city itself has put forward um, $36 million towards what they're calling the expedited housing initiative. So how do we move people from temporary accommodation into something that's more permanent for them. So we're beginning to see um, the government funding step up and be allocated to those permanent solutions. Nan, I heard you try to get in and uh, whatever you want to say, please say it now. <laughs> Just two things. I think one, one thing that's uh, come up, I believe, is that a real interest in getting rid of congregate shelter, that uh, having everybody sleeping together is just not a good public health strategy, not a humane strategy, not a dignified strategy, and something we should move away from. That's never really been on the agenda in the U.S., and a lot of people are thinking and talking about that. The other thing is that there has there been a lot of resources on the table, and that has given jurisdictions the ability to really start pushing the people into housing a lot faster, moving people into housing a lot faster. Yeah, I mean, you talk about the fact that th there, there could be some benefits, even if they're only small ones, coming out of this. Uh, you'll know, you'll be aware of this Community Solution Homeless Charity um, in, in the United States had this to say, the choices we make now will determine whether we accelerate reductions in homelessness or whether we slip back into conditions that made our communities and neighbours so vulnerable in the first place. It is a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. Lydia? I think that's absolutely true. I mean, you know, just watching how the sector is coming together to learn from each other globally. Um, you know, we're being able to facilitate these global conference calls where, you know, our partners from all around the world are saying, here's what we're doing. It's like a moment to throw everything at the wall and kind of see what sticks and, you know, what's coming to the forefront of this, like Nan said, are new ideas. Like, what if we don't use shelters? What if we move people directly into permanent accommodation? Um, and so, the, you know, with every challenge is an opportunity and, and seeing some of that innovation and creativity and the connection and the sharing around the world um, gives me nothing but optimism that we can take some really big steps forward here in terms of how it we is address quite homelessness. Extraordinary. It is quite extraordinary to hear somebody talking on behalf of a homeless charity and talk about extraordinary optimism. Do, do you share that feeling <laughs> Uh, sometimes I do, and sometimes I don't. We, we're going to need additional resources to be able to get people into housing. We're going to have to increase the supply. Uh, our Congress is sort of back and forth on that, and at the moment, uh, there's not a lot on the table in terms of the stimulus bill and getting some resources to help uh, provide more rental assistance. We have, for example, an eviction moratorium now across the country that will end at the end of the year. It stops people from being evicted. It's not uh, a rent forbearance program, however. So they will still owe all of their rent at the end of the moratorium. And these are a lot of these people are folks that don't have that money to provide then. So we need resources to, to uh, accomplish those goals. But I think that the importance of housing as a health strategy and an economic strategy has been reinforced by this pandemic yep. and the associated recession. It is, a, in a way, a resetting of a social agenda. It can be. I, you know, I think we, at, at, of course, here also we have, we're having this great upheaval around racial equity. That's so important. And it's, it's presenting a way forward that's more equitable, workable, and fair. It's, we have also an election coming up. Uh, in a few weeks here. So I think there's a lot to be, there's a lot that's unknown about what direction things are going to go on, go in. And in, 
in the U.S. moving forward. But I'm with Lydia. I'm, I'm hopeful about it often. And I think it's possible for us to do so much better than we're doing. One quick important thing to mention is that the cost of not doing things, the cost of letting uh, police and emergency rooms and healthcare systems and so forth deal with homelessness because we're just unwilling to provide people with the floor of housing and decent health care and food, that cost is also significant. And it's not necessarily going to cost more uh, to house people than it does to leave them on the streets. I know you've been saying that for years and years, uh, Nan, and also you, Lydia, as well. It, it doesn't work out cost effective to leave people on the street when you're at, it's actually costing society a great deal more, as well as causing suffering. Perhaps now some people are listening. I want to say thank you very, very much indeed for coming on this program um, and good luck with all of the work that you're doing. Um, and thank you wherever you happen to be for watching this edition of Roundtable. For me, David Foster, until next time, goodbye for now.